Good evening. We're uh, very happy to see you all here uh, tonight as part of <coughs> the one of the first big events for uh, to commemorate 50 years of African studies at Ohio University. And uh, the project that we designed uh, is, is what we're calling our Common Reader Project, where we had about a dozen faculty members in both fall and spring semesters assign um, uh, the conscript to their classes to read, and, uh, and then we would launch the, um, uh, the reading with uh, a talk by the, the translator, Dr. Girmay Nagash, as well as to focus on what I think of as the, uh, the main theme of uh, Girmay's project and, and this particular uh, project for our common reader, as well as uh, an extremely important aspect of African studies at Ohio University, which is uh, the study of African languages. And uh, we're proud to teach about seven of them uh, here on this campus from a continent where more than 2,000 are spoken. And um, in, in thinking about language and introducing um, Germain Nagash tonight, I was remembering my first and only visit to, um, to Asmara, Eritrea, where I visited with Germain and his family in 2003, I think it was, or four, uh, 10 years ago, I think. And um, as we sat down to our first meal with me and Germain's wife and, and his two uh, lovely daughters, uh, one of them asked me, uh, are you a languager like my dad? And that word has always stuck with me. And, and I think it's, uh, it's a, very, a very useful one, an important one, particularly for what we're trying to do this evening in terms of um, the very exciting process which I was so privileged to, um, to observe as, as Gurmai was translating this, this novel. Um, <clears throat> first of all, to see how remarkably rapidly he turned it into a, 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 a beautiful English prose, um, but also the, his excitement about what essentially was happening was opening a new window for us uh, into into Africa. I'm I'm reminded of a uh, an African saying that I'm. Um, struggling to remember in, in full, and I've consulted with many of my African experts out there, none of whom could help me with this, by the way. Um, but it's something like the, um, uh, the, the lion never gets to tell his story because it's always the, the hunter who, who, gets, who tells the story, um, ultimately, and the lion is dead, of course. But in this case, with the conscript, it's what I think about as I read it is a remarkable uh, sort of insight into the uh, the mind of a colonized person really early on in the process of colonization that we we usually think of and are associated with much later in Africa's uh, independence process. So this is uh, so very remarkable that uh, Germay has given us this gift in English of being able to um, understand and, and enjoy this uh, remarkable novel. So, <clears throat> of course, um, Dr. Germain Nagash doesn't really need an introduction in this crowd. He's professor of English and, and African literature. <clears throat> and um, he makes uh, life in Athens very, very interesting. So we're looking forward to his talk about the conscript. Welcome, Germain. Uh, good evening, uh, Steve, thank you very much for that very generous introduction. Everyone, uh, thank you for, for, for coming tonight. Uh, <coughs> it looks actually very festive, so I hope my talk is not going to be that boring. The title I have given to this presentation or talk is Towards Africa Renaissance Thoughts on the Conscript as a Postcolonial and Global Genre. 
in his, in his new book, Global Ethics, Theory and Politics of Knowing, Ngugi Watiango imagines postcolonial literatures to be the foundation of global or world literature. Ngugi's notion of world literature is inspired by a general Marxian idea of the inevitable universal interdependence of nations, but more specifically draws upon the concept of wealth literature or world literature first proposed by Johann Wolfgang um, Goethe, the enlightened German poet who in the 19th century considered the idea of national literature an already exhausted term and subsequently urged his contemporary Europeans to, to strive to hasten the arrival of the epoch of world literature. When Goethe conceived of the idea of world literature, he was thinking so much about internationalizing German literature within the European literary system as he was interested in re-energizing the national literature of his country by infusing it through translation and critical discussion with ideational and linguistic influences of the, of the best works other European writers had to offer. As it appeared in Proplen, that was in 1801, a literary journal Goethe founded in collaboration with a small group of friends, Goethe's argument for and characterization of world literature read in part as follows. It is to be hoped that people will soon be convinced that there is no such thing as patriotic art or patriotic science. Both belong, like all good things, to the whole world and can be fostered only by untrammeled intercourse among all contemporaries, continually bearing in mind what we have inherited from the past. And some years later, in 1827, he added, I am more and more convinced today that poetry is the universal possession of mankind, revealing itself everywhere and at all times in hundreds and hundreds of men. We Germans are very likely to fall too easily into this pedantic conceit when we don't look beyond the narrow circle that surrounds us. I, therefore, like to look about me in foreign nations and advise everyone to do the same. National literature is now a rather unmeaning term. The epoch of world literature is at hand, and everyone must try to hasten its coming. Mbugi Watiango, in making connections, that is in the book I uh, mentioned, called Global Ethics, uh, he is trying to make connections between the post-colonial and the global, and he stresses that while there is no term that can really substitute for the one coined by Goethe, and undoubtedly world literature should be broadly understood as a coalition, a cohesion, and a coalescence of literatures in world languages in our present age, it starts the quote by Ngugi, the post-colonial is undeniably the closest to that Gothian and the Marxian conception of world literature, because it is a product of different streams and influences from different points of the globe, a diversity of sources, which it reflects in turn. The post-colonial is inherently outward-looking, inherently international in its very constitution in terms of themes, language, and the intellectual formation of the writers. End of quote. I must say immediately for the benefit of those who are not necessarily familiar with the internal debates of post-colonial studies, that the field is highly divided on definitional matters at this point of time. There are two camps, basically. As Paul Jay in his book, Global Matters, the transnational term in literary studies reports, there are those who show the exclusive tendency to keep post-colonial studies as a separate, closed entity, and those who seek to go beyond the limitations of post-colonial theory in their approach and call post-colonial literatures post-post-colonial, okay, post-colonial, then you have post-post-colonial literatures or transnational literatures, and endeavor to analyze those texts by paying, by paying more attention the inter intersecting histories of colonialism, decolonization, and globalization. Now, if you stand on the exclusive side of this binary, Ngugi's claimed status for post-colonial literature comes, of course, as an ironic twist in the definition or characterization of post-colonial literature. This is because in this definition, post-colonial literatures are not any longer as they have been traditionally defined and characterized the peripheral, the marginal, or the subaltern, and what have you, uh, literatures of the world system, but rather take place the position of mainstream literature, because in Ngugi's arrangement, they are made uh, to be the center. The problem with this conceptual reordering, Ngugi's critics may or will further argue, is that his characterization is not merely academic or terminological, 
but also a problem that raises or hides important questions regarding the identity, the language, the audience, and the future thematic orientations of post-colonial literatures. And some of these questions are, what are the material and aesthetic bases that turn or have turned post-colonial literature into a position of centrality? It is because they have exhausted their critical force against external and internal oppression and injustice, or is it a designation that comes with a, a cultural appropriation? In other words, are people just getting becoming fashionable, you know, changing a term for another term? If postcolonial writers are the default of all literature, do they still also continue, or are they expected to continue to critically voice the condition of the poor and other subaltern sections of society? And if so, how will their change in status from the margin to the center affect or even alter their thematic concerns and relationships? with the disenfranchised communities of the post-colony with which they have been historically associated. In short, the question is this for me. Can a post-colonial writer be the other and mainstream at the same time? This is a difficult question. These are difficult questions pending for bigger discussion and reflection. The answer to these questions will be crucial for the future of post-colonial literatures. That being said, it is also possible to argue in favor of Ngugi's hypothesizing of post-colonial literature as the center or kernel of world literature. And this is what I'm going to do now. It seems to me that Ngugi's point is not merely about gaming with words, with words that is calling the post-colonial global, but more significantly about emphasizing the prominence and vitality of post-colonial literature in bringing new literary voices born out of other, say, non-Western experiences and thus diversity and complexity of perspectives into the realm of global literature. And in this particular sense, it hardly needs, hardly needs to be said that, as Ngugi also intimates in his book, that world literature could never have become what it is today without the robust contributions of postcolonial art and writing, such as those, for example, from the surrealist and magic realist influences of the arts and writings of India. And I was thinking of uh, Rashti, for example, of Africa, think of Singapore and others, and Latin America, think of Garcia, etc., etc. <coughs> Nor is it even thinkable for the field and study of Euro-American literature to be productively read and studied by students and scholars without invoking its relationship with these post-colonial literatures. In this case, think of Conrad Kipling, uh, Shakespeare himself, <coughs> and even Ezra Pound, etc., etc. But if the vitality and contribution of post-colonial literature is so vivid and productive as to make Ngugi claim its contemporary centrality, the relevant question to be asked here is, what then are the salient elements or features that, according to him, constitute the globality of post-colonial writing? Ngugi addresses this question extensively when he maps out the main topographies of post-colonial writing. He focuses on the in her inherently outward looking and diversity of sources. He gives examples and text also to demonstrate this point. Uh, one of the prime examples he uses to illustrate his point is the case of the widely debated lit literary figure Caliban, who appears both in William Shakespeare's The Tempest and Emma Caesar's reworked parody of Shakespeare's play. Through this literary character, Ngugi shows how the enslaved black man, Caliban, who had been judged as non-human by his master Prospero, was, ab was able to use the knowledge of the language and culture that was imposed on him by his master to create a human sense of himself. Despite his bondage in Bogi Argus, it was because Caliban understood the language and mindset of Prospero, while the latter knew nothing about the tongue of the bondsman and the culture that it carries, that Caliban, as an inheritor of both worlds and as a carrier of thought, of what the boys called a double consciousness, was ultimately able to stand on a firmer and broader ground in rejecting prosperous narrative history. Turning to the experience of African writers and literature, Ngugi further provides a long catalogue of African writers who, with differentiation, exhibit that he boys their double consciousness in their work, but also then, because empowered by their freed ontological st status that followed Africa's decolonization, are able to transcend the limitations to create a more coherent and authoritative narrative than, for example, Caliban was able to do because of his fragmented and colonized being. 
drawing on the history of modern African writing and his own involvement in the process, Mbugi further reveals the complex dialectical tensions that African writers underwent in their aspirations to develop, on the one hand, a national literature for their emergent na nations, while on the other hand, also hoping, striving to yet come, uh, come out of their isolation. He puts it this way. There was this ironic twist in the emergent reality, a little remnant of that master uh, um, slave narrative. Even if they wanted, the writers from the colony could not divest themselves of the literature and culture they had imbibed in the master's classroom. But if colonial, ed colonial educational regime, excuse me, played a decisive role in instilling a deeply damaged and alienated consciousness in the African writer, its enabling effects to carve out new methods and genres, and genres of writing that have established, are now establishing, and will establish in the future the rebirth or renaissance of a new African literature, also clearly visible for Mkopi. And in this regard, he offers several uh, examples from Caribbean and African writers to demonstrate So Ngugi, I was saying, offers several examples from uh, Caribbean and African writers to demonstrate how they have in the past recreated and continue to create such new writing by transforming the, the, the demands of colonial bondage to their own advantage. Prominent among his examples are the leading lights of Pan-Africanism, ranging from artists and thinkers such as Emma Cesar to Ole Seyinka to Chino Achebe. He writes thus. Amy Cesar admitted his roots to surrealism. Surrealism led him to Africa, to his negritude, buried beneath the surface of his French education and cultural assimilation. A, a wole Seyunka could not write as if he had not read the Bible, studied Greek and Latin classics, wrestled with Ben Johnson and Shakespeare, and communed with the Anglo-Irish. At the same time, the Yoruba pantheon infuses his work. In his work, the Yoruba, the Judeo-Greco-Latin, and the Anglo-Irish are unified in a new synthesis. Achebe's titles like Things Fall Apart and No Longer At Ease are homages to the writer's intellectual formation. The title of my own first published novel, that is in Gugish, Weep Not Child, was taken from the American poet Walt Whitman. Some of these phrases have become part of the intellectual everyday in Africa. But even beyond the titles, the intertextuality of European African literature with the European is remarkable. Now, Ngugi's <coughs> list of Pan-African postcolonial writers and his thoughts of how their texts should be read as at the same time both postcolonial and global texts could be extended extensively. Gabriel Yusufzai's novel, The Conscript, is one of those novels which, being written, in Tigrinya, in the Tigrinya language, by an author who had moved to Europe as a student, traversing the Red Sea, there is a map here, thank you, Steve. The coastal waters of Sudan, Egypt, and the Mediterranean provides a staggering account and profound insight into the workings of Italian colonialism in Africa. As in the case of most African writers, Heinz's writing was also infused by the native oral and written traditions of his culture, as well as by European poetic influences. Heinz's of tradition is pervasive in the novel, and particularly evident in his frequent use of Tibinia proverbs and local imagery he effectively uses to tell his story. His intertextual allusion to European sources comes out clearly when Heinz references to Italian history books which he at once peruses and criticizes. On page 32 uh, of the conscript, in the edition we have that is, for example, Heinz describes the Arab character as unsympathetic, but reversing the criticism to its sources instantly adds, these are stereotypical stories and slurs about them, which I copied from a book, in fact, a book written in Italian. But Hylus' uh, conversation with European textuality is felt even more directly so when he quotes verbatim. Lines from the poetry of Giacomo Leopardi an Italian poet who lived from 1798 to 1837, 
And according to the New York Review of Books of this week, I have it somewhere with me. Uh, I want to show it here. Uh, this is the New York Review of Books of this week, and this is uh, Leopardi. <coughs> so uh, he quotes, there is, there is a poem from, from this person in this book. And according to the New York Review of, of Books, uh, he is regarded today as the author of some of the finest poetry ever written in Italian. So I'm trying to bring the influences. Uh, sometimes it's just like, this, this came to uh, our house uh, last night, actually. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> there is always the risk of over-interpretation, but with some stretch of imagination, Hiles' breathtaking description of the Eritrean and Mediterranean seascapes could also be perfectly <coughs> read, interpreted, that is, as a 20th century intertextual transformation of the famous historical text called The Fairness <coughs> of the Eritrean Sea. This travelogue was written in 1580 by an anonymous Greek traveler and merchant who had traveled to the Red Sea and into the deep highland plains of Eritrea and Aksumite Ethiopia to advance hunting of, rhin <coughs> of rhinos and elephants for trade in ivory. They were exchanging it for silver plates, knives, and caps, etc., etc. But what is interesting is that traveler also reported about his meeting with Aksumite King of Ethiopia, called Toskalis, who describes, it, he describes him as thrifty and always striving for more, but otherwise an upright man and acquainted with Greek literature. So this, this influences kind of from Europe to Africa. Uh, it is, this is happening already happening in the uh, uh, early on, 1580. Uh, so some of the people in that part of the world also were conversant, say, say in uh, Greek literature. However, aside from a variety of actual and imagined literary influences that Heil would use it or may have used it to craft his novelistic uh, uh, creation, the paramount reason that should encourage us to read him as a postcolonial uh, club global artist as outward forms of perspective that are noticeable throughout his novel. Instances that indicate Heil's open and critical mind are already in the opening sections of the text. We see this, for example, in his even-handed portrayal of the Eritrean Muslim family in the story, when he tells us about the main character's carefree rural upbringing, that the young boy and his father enjoy the friendship and intimacy of their Muslim friends. Considering that Hyde was a Christian priest, this even-handed and affectionate description is quite remarkable for his time. Another example is Hyde's description of Tukawa's encounter with the Sudanese in the town of Port Sudan. Observing the prejudices of the Sudanese and the Habesha harbor about each other, Hail is shocked by the mutual ignorance. He knowingly writes about the encounter. There, the two peoples, the two Africans, the Ethiopians and the Sudanese, came face to face. The latter were thinking, these slaves, they are going to Tripoli for money, while the former were thinking, these black people, they could never be superior to us, both harshly judging each other. <coughs> Once we are prepared to enter into the novelist's or narrator's critical voice in this way, the text gradually, building momentum through language and action, takes us into the more dramatic phases of the character's experience, the climax, as we know, of course, of which is to cover encounters with the Libyan national fighters and his actual experiences of the war. As you have read, uh, most of you have read the uh, book, I think, now. The conscript depicts the Eritrean conscripts as they depart from Asmara, and arrive in the Libyan deserts after sailing for weeks, beginning from the Eritrean port of Massawa through Port Sudan, the Red Sea, Egypt, and the shallow waters of the Suez Canal. Both the journey and the encounter with the Libyan insurgents are anything but astounding and overwhelming for the conscripts. Not only had the Eritrean conscripts gotten their first glimpse and physical encounter with the Arab world and peoples, but they were also astonished by the bravery and the love of freedom of the Libyan Arabs. When thinking about colonialism uh, and the ensuing battles in Libya, I want, to, I want us to be reminded, I want us to note that although Italian colonialism in Africa has been routinely described as a benign colonialism, Italian colonialism is always like a benign colonialism and the Italians love it really. Uh, well, I think because they gave us caption and spaghetti, right? Excellent. It is it's described as benign uh, colonialism, uh, but the Italian colonization of Libya, which uh, was 
from 1911 to 1940 was in fact one of the bloodiest conquests in African history. By 1932, when Marshal Pietro uh, Badoglio, the Italian governor of Libya, declared the total pacification of the colony, at least 100 Libyan soldiers and civilians had lost their lives in defense of their country. According to Angelo del Volca, an Italian historian, the population of Libya in the 1920s was about 800,000. And again, according to him, if that figure is correct, this means that one-eighth of the population was exterminated. Del Boca's description of the colonial violence further reveals the systematic structure of the genocide. What's important to remember, moreover, is also that the war between Italy and Libyan, the Libyan revolutionary was not always a war fought between Italians and the Libyans. As other colonial powers in Africa, for example, the British and the French had done, the Italian colonial order was too clever and cynical enough to use the bodies of colonized Africans to destroy the bodies of other colonized Africans in order to sustain its imperialist adventure. The point in case, Italian colonialism exploited the religious differences of its colonial subjects and utilized the predominantly Christian, Eritrean, and Ethiopian Islanders, the Askaris, that is the conscripts, to fight against the Muslim Libyan insurgency. Before and during their expedition to Libya, the Eritrean conscripts were conditioned <coughs> through colonial indoctrination, which subtly and imperceptibly caricatured, belittled, and demonized the culture and the valor of the Arabs, so that their mind was colonized to believe that they saw the Muslim Arab as an easy target enemy, and themselves as the faithful servants of the empire. That the anti-Arab prejudice of the conscripts was driven by colonial propaganda, which was designed to deepen their thinking in simplistic binarisms, was clear to Hailu, the author of the conscript. Hailu knew, moreover, that the anti-Arab prejudice was not one simply of rhetoric generated by Italian colonialism, but also that the conscripts had falsely internalized much of the colonial supremacist and stereotyping. It is for this reason, or for this reason, Hailu is critical of the conscripts' complicity more sharply, more radically, even than against Italian colonialism. I is critical of the conscripts, comp uh, okay. He does so uh, by providing a corrective in which he reveals a balanced and more truthful account of the conscripts participation. As I wrote in the translator's note to my English translation of Hailu's novel, indeed Hailu, while on the one hand creates a dissident ca central character to expose the evils of European colonialism on the African continent. On the, other, on the other hand, his concurrent acknowledgement of an African native complicity, very clearly articulated in the novel, shows the tragic reality in which the colonizers found themselves under colonialism. The deconstruction of the idea that the conscripts had a superior age over the inferior Arabs is further sharpened by Hailu, particularly when the two armies come face to face at war. Colonial brainwashing of the conscripts and cynicism against the Arabs notwithstanding, the Libyan enemy, as told in Hyde's novel, proves a formidable challenge to Eritrean conscripts, and many of them perish in the Libyan desert. Humiliated by their defeat in the battles against the Libyan nationalists, the Eritrean conscripts, and especially the novel's main hero, uh, Tukabo, finally come to the realization of the ironic contradiction that they were fighting to maintain the same colonial system by which they themselves and their the other people were oppressed. As the narrator puts it, it was strange to watch the Habesha, who at first did nothing when their land was taken and bowed to the Italians like dogs, now preparing to see them preparing to fight those Arabs who wanted to defend their country. Uh, the Tigrinian version is wonderful. This is kind of my return. My return. Okay. I love that. Although Hailu intends to redeem the conscripts from demonization and scapegoating shows uh, somehow shares the nationalist uh, boastfulness of the conscripts. Those of you who have read is a little bit kind of kind to, 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 to them. He says they were brave, they were, you know, they were heroic and they did this and so on despite everything. So it's kind of sharing uh, that, 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 that nationalism. But once it is clear uh, <coughs> that his central character, Tsukabo, no longer believes in the colonial war like a good novelist. He sides with his character and follows him as he is transformed into a defeated soldier, an anti-hero whose world has fallen apart. However, unlike Achebes Okonko in Things Fall Apart, Hailus Tsukabo does not end in self-destruction. 
Instead, to have a seamless the role of a returning veteran soldier, who lives to tell the to tell the lies and deceptions of colonial of colonialism and war to his people and the world. In one of the memorable passages of the conscript, the narrator mimicking Tukabo provides a very strong parody showing the dehumanizing treatment of the conscripts by the Italian commanders. In this passage, an Italian officer is caricatured as he scolds the conscripts with racist language and threatens them with corporeal punishment. This is all black Eritrean Ascari. Those whom we are now going to fight against are but a bunch of shepherds. You may perhaps be frightened because they are whites. However, they are not like us. We alone are the brave whites. We Italians, your masters. Hence, beat him, the Arab enemy, don't be afraid of him. If we happen to find goats, camels, cattle, donkeys, or sheep, we'll give you some to slaughter and eat. However, woe unto him who finds gold, silver, or any similar item and keeps it for himself. I shall flog his bare buttocks with 55 lashes of the whip in front of everyone. You should feel gratified and privileged for fighting under the Italian banner. As previously discussed at the theoretical realm by Ashil Mbembe in his book on the post-colony, there is of course no doubt that such language was never merely a gesture of disciplining bodies nor specific to the Italian colony of Eritrea. It was rather paradigmatic of colonial Europe's deep desire and actual method of controlling the African body. As Mbembe tells it, along the economic exploitation, the whip and the cane also served to force upon the African a concocted identity. An identity that allowed him to move in the spaces where he was always ordered around and where he had unconditionally to show submissiveness in forced labor, public works, local corvée labor, and military conscription. The significance of Gabriel Hailu uh, is that, and now I am wrapping up, he deeply understood the evils of colonialism and how it abused the colonized and also how it besieged them, and documented it in one of the oldest novels of Africa very early on in 1927. Equally significant, Hailu, formed by indigenous and European education, was also very much aware of the paradox of African complicity in the European colonial project and explicitly wrote about it too. In that sense, Hailu could be considered the forerunner of post-colonial African art and vision. But because his brand of post-coloniality, which obviously prefigured those of M. Cesar, Wolesha Yinka, Chino Achebe, and many others, is inherently outward looking, inherently internationalist, indeed, as Ngugu Watiango would say, in its very constitution, in terms of language, in terms of themes, and the intellectual formation of the writer. And therefore, he must also be counted as one of the founders of global African literature. It is also in this originality of thought and forward looking global awareness and ethical audacity wherein lies. Hylus genius. And for me, it's also because of this inevitable gift that Hylu left for world literature that we are able to read and celebrate his work as global citizens and readers in our campus today. As we celebrate the 50th anniversary of African studies this year, it is my hope that this renewed interest in African literature is continued. And if that happens, we will truly be on the cusp of a new African literary renaissance. Thank you, Ohio University. <coughs> thank you, faculty. Thank you, students, for honoring this book as a common reader. Uh, let's take a few questions for Mr. Nagash. About a quarter of the way through, you said, you, I want to ask the question, can the post-colonial be mainstream and the other? And I just want to ask for a point of clarification, why, are you, why do you ask the question? Is it perpetuating a binary or what are you, or what are you interested in doing with the question? 
Uh, that, that's a very good question. The question is, um, it, it is there, it's a real question. So uh, there is this post-colonial writing, post-colonial writing, as you know, have been associated with, with, with you know, poor people, colonized people, who are always kind of uh, on the margins. Uh, so it is, it is also, um, I think, psychological thing. Uh, some are saying we should really keep this, this post-colonial, say, so-called post-colonial <coughs> literature a little bit separate. We have kind of uh, to protect it in, I, I don't know, secretive way. <laughs> uh, we should not give it away, and then if it becomes global, it becomes mainstream, and you know, the writers win prizes, they become big, they are not going to write about poverty, about ecological destruction, about other, you know, human you know, suffering and so on and so forth. So it's a real thing, and it does happen. As some of the post colonial writers uh, moved on they change, I mean, they change their topics, their commitment, and so on. So the question I'm, I'm, I'm posing is, can it be really the other in the sense of the post-coloniality? Okay? Uh, there, is, there, is, there is a difference. And then becoming, become the center as well. Because in uh, looking at, at Ngugi's model, we say, well, the post-colonial is really the core thing. It's the center. It's reversing it. So people are, are studying post-colonial literature from, from the traditional way, from the marginal the sub theory of subalternity and so on. Actually, you can't do this, because if you, if you take this away, then there is nothing left. It's no more it. Um, yeah. So I am kind of abstracting it in my So if the post-colonial is the other, and this is the same, can it be, uh, you know, can the other be the same? Typical postmodernist question. Uh, I re respond from you. not your question. So, yeah. I, I, I want to push you more on this. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This is an interesting question. <laughs> okay, go ahead. So you know, we, we know what Ngugi's politics are. We know what Ngugi's politics are, and he's very committed to this particular vision of post-colonial African literature. But in Achebe's last book, which I found to be really sort of terrible, right? He spends a good chunk of the first bit talking about how wonderful his education was among the Christian missionaries, and how great the English canon is, and how influential it's been in his writing. And if you look at contemporary Nigerian fiction, for example, you look at Ngozi's most recent book, right, it's America, um, a book that you can only buy at the mall in Abuja and at the airport, right, that's not available widely in Nigeria and that speaks in a very direct way only to sort of Western audiences. It strikes me that that position, right, that description of what African literature looks like today is in a lot of ways more defensible than the one that Ngugi is proposing. Right? That in fact a lot of what sort of passes for global, this global literature which the post-colonial is at the center, is really marketed mostly at Americans and Europeans. And that Ngugi's convictions you know, are, are what they are, but a lot of the literature that he's praising, that he really wants to put at the center, still remains economically and practically at the margins. Um, is, that, I mean, is, that, is that a fair assessment, or am I missing something about what it is? No, what I mean, it's, 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 it's a fair assessment. The, 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 um, there is, there is another writer, or generally I just kind of replicate the, the, the conversation that's going on. Uh, there, are, there, is, there is some good stuff coming out in post-colonial, say, transnational uh, criti critical theory. What's the title of the book? Open City by Tejuji. Tejuji. Oh, right. I mean, that is, that, that, that is global transnational. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I think a lot depends on how we look at how you kind of a book resonates with you. Uh, I can imagine, and it's, it's happened to me, you know, um, a lot, I guess to many people, even if you are reading a book by an American writer or something, you can read a lot of post-colonial stuff that, you know. Yeah? Okay. I guess it might be interesting to think about what you are talking about with the flip of the, the post-colonial and the margin, the center, in terms of, you started your talk by saying the Tigrinya version, there are very few copies in existence. Could you perhaps talk about why that is and compare it to the dissemination of the Ohio University Press book and how it's selling? Yeah, sure. Uh, this is an old book. Uh, so. Uh, I mean, the history of this one is, uh, I see a point, so I'll come to that. This is kind of, I, there are two sides to the question. 
Uh, this book was written in 1927, uh, so it was not published immediately. It was published in 1950. There were uh, the historical conditions, the political situation in Eritrea was not favorable at that time. Uh, so this has also kind of um, you no know, difficult uh, publication history behind it. Um, and then, well, with, 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 with the war and so on and so forth, it, it, it did not get published. That is one. Uh, also, I should say, um, although people were reading this book for a long time in the country, in Eritrea and in Tigrinya, many people know it, at least those who read are interested in poetry and literature. Uh, but uh, it was, it, I mean, it was not translated. There was no access to the outside world. Uh, so this book has not been republished. It's, it is also, uh, I guess, because of the perspective, it kind of uh, it cares with it. Um, there is, it is not, it's not. This is not a nationalist book, right? This is not patriotic at all. It's very critical. Actually, it's saying you know you you yeah you know you are mercenary, right? As, as it, what it is, they have been colonized and they have not resisted. Where is your resistance? And they are kind of now going to uh, uh, kill people. Uh, that, that, that's its history. Uh, not all. The, okay, there is there are, there is a lot written in African indigenous languages, which means in Tigrinya, in Swahili, as you know. Um, and Amharic and so on and so forth. So there is there is a lot. Okay, that part of literature uh, of, of of African literature is there, but it is read by people who read those languages. Okay. Having said that, I should also maybe say that not everything that is written in you know in those languages is great and good and fascinating to be you know to to circulate around the world. Okay. Uh, here also, I mean, Americans write so. Good books, interesting books, and it changes. So it's very, it's very complex. Uh, with this one, uh, it's one of these few kind of uh, best unknown uh, novels that, that is that is you know we translated with a joint project with I Press President. Now um, it, 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 it is there, uh, but it is publication question of language, language barriers. Uh, the universities in Africa, most of them are very weak, right? Um, and so on and so forth. I was going to, I don't want to get more political because a lot is happening in the politics. But that is, that is, that's what it is. Okay. We should spend more money and energy, I guess, right? Uh, and help our poets and writers and, 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 and so on and so forth instead of killing people. You know? oh. By the way, the uh, Kofi Abner was died, died last time, he was killed by Shabab. Uh, one of the greatest African poets. He, he was in Ohio University. Actually, he, uh, he was invited here by the Creative Writing Program and so on and so forth. So this this guy is gone. Why? I mean, you know, what was it anyway? So, uh, that that is the situation where where African literature culture is also is also working. So my hope is uh, not really to sell this book or or anything, but to be read. Uh, so this is a conversation. This is this is this is part of the global. Uh, energy, poetic energy going on. Uh, so I am very happy that people are reading it in, in, in translation. But the politics of writing in Africa is going to be very complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is our last question. Uh, when it comes to particularly um, this debate, you know, within the post-colonial perspective in general, I always try to. Uh, look at things from the perspective <coughs> that puts language at the center of that whole uh, thing as to which point is the center and which point is the, the periphery. Because, uh, you know, uh, I find it a little bit problematic for most of these African, uh, you know, critics or writers in general to sort of try to talk about, you know, the post-colonial literature has become the center in the sense that it's been more productive at a point that it, it equals, you know, what used to be the center. And we talked a lot about it when we discussed the empire rights, but 
things like that. But it is still writing in a language that is colonial, you know. And, and, and in that sense, I think, even though the content of these artworks or whatever that we produce, content-wise, they are mainstream and they're rooted in this uh, center where they're being produced, the language that they use make them, in a sense, subjected to this center which is still there, which is the, the Western world. You know? So uh, you talked a little bit about how uh, this book has been published in Tigrinya, but it didn't circulate. You know, what was the challenge for that circulation, I can guess, is that the language stability was accessible to other countries, to other countries. And these boundaries exist everywhere in Africa, like if you publish a book in Europe in Senegal, it's not going to go beyond the Senegambian region. So, you know, there is this limit, which is, you know, language is speaking, so then right. how did you bring yeah. this? Uh, the, the discussion, the conversation, as you know, has been uh, among African students and uh, especially with, I mean, kind of crystallized between Bogi and Achebe. Um, some people have argued that you really need to write in your own language, okay? Because that's what the energy is, that is what the, you know, subliminal kind of connections you can make, that is what the poetry is because it comes from the subconscious, okay? And the language, uh, the subconscious is stored in your, in your primary, say, language. Uh, Others, uh, well, you write in the language you're actually <laughs> able to write in, right? Uh, if you, if I can write in Wolof, if you can write in Wolof, you write in Wolof. If you, if you can write in French, you write in French. What was the problem? Okay. Um, that discussion, I don't want to downplay it. That discussion has political dimensions. It has, you know, economic, social dimensions. Uh, so, an African writer who writes in the English language, for example, is published in New York or. In you write in French in Paris, so you will have more exposure, whereas somebody who writes in Wolof or in Tigrinya will not be kind of known or be read in, in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in the West. Uh, I guess uh, I've been engaged in, this, in that kind of discussion as well, still think about it about. Uh, I think it, it has reached that conversation, language, non language thing, it has reach it kind of, it's dead end, okay? People write in the language they can best express themselves. That is available, accept, accessible to them, okay? Um, the solution seems to me, um, uh, we didn't see it, I think, before. Some uh, had seen it already. So how do you get that if, for example, a book is written in Wolof, uh, how do you get it to the global leaders, right? Uh, the medium is there. I think it is done through translation. Uh, if a book is written in French, a French writer in Paris, well, say here, if those of us who can read French may read it, but somebody will translate it into English and it will be read in the English language. Okay? Mind you, translation is, is really, 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 it, it is kind of it is, it is another language, it's in own, its own language. Uh, when you think about it, Renaissance would have never happened with, with, with our translation. Uh, the English reading, say, audience would have never been able to read the German philosophers had it not been for translation, okay? Uh, Latin literature would have never been what, has, what had it become without <coughs> being translated from Greek into, right? In, 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 into Latin, and so on and so forth. So it is change, 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 change. Uh, some of the things I'm seeing while thinking and a little bit trying to write and research about this translation uh, idea as a language is also, when you translate, for example, from, say, French into English, you are not just translating, merely translate, translating from French into English. You are also translating, say, traces, uh, language, idioms, thoughts, ideas, culture, which is already embedded, embodied, I have to say, in that French language, which connects you. That French language might have gotten it from Greek, for example, shall we say? Uh, it might have gotten it from Arabic, shall we say? It might have gotten it even from, say, from Mediterranean. Because you had those scholars 
the king, he was versed in Greek literature, right? And merchants were coming and going. And so I'm not necessarily kind of trying to, to make a point that everything was but the Venya, which may anyway. <laughs> but this influences from, from translation from one language to another language, it is, it is, it is deeper than that. Thing. I think uh, we'll, we'll stop with questions there.